Okay, I'm going to welcome Jenny onto the stage in a sec. She's just going to share a screen, get that all ready to go. And uh, Jenny, welcome. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick introduction. Uh, now, Jenny is a, a TDI instructor trainer. She's an advanced mixed gas rebreather diver and an instructor for the human diver as well. Um, now, she lives and works in Dahab, Egypt, as a full-time instructor of diver, diving, photography, and, and human factors. Um, and a number of her photos, I think they're all her photos, are in her presentation, which you've seen, which are fantastic. So what she's going to talk about is um, what situation awareness is, um, how to assess a buddy or a student's awareness, and, and how to help them improve. Now, this is a must for anyone who's wondered why their buddy has done something just like illogical. It's like, what are you doing? Didn't, didn't you see what was there? Um, and she's going to explain these sort of concepts. And help you better understand why people lose situation awareness. So Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much, Gara. Um, well, originally this uh, presentation was called How to Assess Situational Awareness in Others. But uh, having looked through my notes, I do wonder whether I should have called it How to Mess Up 101 Times, because uh, I've used rather a lot of examples from myself as proof that situational awareness can be lost by absolutely anybody, even those that should know better. So um, I thought I'd talk about how to assess it in others, but it's also about how to assess it in yourself, because it's something that's really difficult to know. Whether you're an instructor or whether you're a student on a course or just a regular diver is something that we can all practice and it's incredibly relevant. I think it's one of the most important subjects when it comes to human factors out of everything. Now, during this presentation, I'm going to explain what we mean by situational awareness, as well as giving you some key points that you can use in your day-to-day -day diving to help you assess situational awareness in others and hopefully make yourself more aware of your own awareness as well. Now, as I said, situational awareness and losing situational awareness can happen to anybody. And when we think about it, we often think about situations like this photo just here. This poor guy with his camera desperately trying to take photos of sharks, and yet the shark is right behind him. Now, in our case, it's our awareness that's lacking because what we can't see just out of frame is another blue shark in front of him and that's what he was swimming towards to take a photo of. So we don't always have all the information we need, and that's one way where we can lack situational awareness. Now, as Gareth said, uh, I live in Dahab in Egypt, and I dive in the Red Sea. That's my home diving area. Um, and one time I was diving at the Blue Hole fairly recently. My job that day was to film a diver. Now, the blue hole is not known for its big creatures, so that's okay. I'm going to focus on my diver and focus on getting the shot that I need. My job was made slightly more difficult that day because I had a brand new camera in my hands that I hadn't used very much at all, and I'd never used underwater. So my focus was very much taken up by simply manipulating the buttons and making sure everything was doing what I wanted to do. And the rest of my attention was taken by my diver, making sure that he was in the frame and he was there and doing what he should be doing. And the outcome of one of those sections was this video. Now, as you can see, Sometimes things don't always go to plan. For those of you that missed it, check out the top right hand corner. So slightly jerky, but just about up there on the top right hand side, you could see the manta ray that swam over his head. To that day, I'd never seen a manta ray and I'm still not sure whether I could uh, properly say that I'd seen it that day. 
Um, you can imagine there were a few choice words said when I got back to the dive center and watched the footage back. But why did that happen? Well, it was simple. My focus was on my diver. I wasn't expecting to see anything particularly big. That was a really unusual sighting in the blue hole. So I'm not looking around for other things. All I'm looking for is to get the shot that I need to get. If I'd have realized, obviously, I could have angled the camera up, could have got the perfect shot of the manta ray just cruising over his head and it would have looked fantastic. But I was concentrating on what I needed to get. Luckily that day I had enough capacity that I was also able to look around me a little bit and see things like my depth, my time, I was on a rebreather, so my PO2, and everything else as well. And having enough capacity is really important. We're gonna talk more about that later on. So I want to show you now a model that was uh, made up by a guy called Mika Endley, Endley. And he's got this fantastic way of explaining situational awareness. Now you'll see it's a rather complicated diagram, but uh, if you look to the left hand side where it says situational awareness, we have on the far left, level one, perception of elements in the current situation. In other words, I see. You need to be able to see what's going around you to be able to gather clues, to get all the information, to have situational awareness. And again, we're gonna be talking about gathering clues later on. Next up, we've got level two, which is comprehension of the current situation. This means I understand, I know what that means. I'm sure you've all seen divers before who are staring at their computers, watching the numbers change as they drop deeper and deeper and not doing anything about it. Because although they see what the dive computer is telling them, they don't necessarily comprehend, they don't understand what it is that's happening. They don't realize that that means they're dropping deeper. It's just numbers changing. Especially if you have students, if you have new open water students, you'll see this on a fairly frequent basis. So that means we need also step three, which is perception, uh, sorry, projection of future status. In other words, I react. So that's where hopefully, once they've got a little bit of understanding what those numbers on the computer mean, and feeling that they're descending, they're gonna react by inflating their BCD and stopping themselves from sinking down. So we need all of those three steps to have true full situational awareness. But there are lots of other things that are affecting us as well. It's not quite as simple as that. So we have things like our goals and objectives. Sometimes if that goal is your one single focus, that might put pressure on actually what your awareness is. In my case, it was trying to film. My goal was to get that footage of my diver to the point where I missed the other things that were coming past us. I didn't see. Also, your expectations of what's going to happen. We can't expect the unexpected. It's impossible. So we have certain preconceptions, certain ideas as to what's going to happen. And we need to remember that that's going to limit our awareness. I certainly didn't expect to see a manta swimming over his head. So I wasn't looking for it. If someone had told me that it was gonna be in the blue hole that day at that depth, then I certainly would have been. <laughs> now, based on all of that, you also need to think about how you're processing that information. And that's our information processing systems. So we have two different parts of that, the long-term memory stores and the automatic systems. The long-term memory stores are what are built up with experience. We're gonna be talking quite a lot about what we mean by experience later on and why we need it. The automatic systems can be built much sooner. Think about when you're driving to work, those of you that drive. The first time you ever got in a car for your first driving lesson, you got in and you sat down and you held the steering wheel and, oh, get right, I need to turn the key and get going. Okay, now what do I do? Everything had to be thought of step by step. But over time, it becomes an automatic process. Now, I dare say in the morning, you get into work, you get into your car to go to work with your coffee in one hand, you arrive at work, 
and you can't even remember getting there. You can't remember the journey at all because it's such an automatic process that it's just kicked in and you're there. You've achieved your goal without even realizing. Doesn't mean you weren't aware of what was going on while you were driving. You most certainly were. But it's such an automatic process. You're not having to think about how you're driving. You're not having to think about accelerating, braking, changing gear, looking around you. It's just automatic. Now, these are all based and all become easier based on our abilities, our experience and our training. The more training we can have, the more automatic the processes can come if it's good training. And the more different ideas you can have, the more long term memory stores you have. You can use different pattern matching to decide exactly what's the right thing to do in this scenario. The more experience you have, you're going to build on that. And of course, the stronger your abilities are, the more your automatic processes will kick in. If you think about uh, um, a Formula One driver, for example, then they're definitely going to be able to steer around things much, much faster than your average driver because their abilities are that much higher, that their processes are kicking in at a faster speed. Now, all of these different factors are then going to affect what our decision making process is. We then need to decide, OK, what do we do with this information? Hopefully, if we have all the correct information, we can make the right decision. So back to that student who's looking at their computer and thinking, they inflate. But if they're a brand new student, maybe they inflate a little bit too much. No worries. We go back to the start. They look, they realize they're now going up. They know what that means and they know they need to deflate. So it keeps constantly going round. Any dive is a series of errors and corrections. We're constantly adjusting small things, whether it's our buoyancy or whether it's something bigger. But these are all based on our awareness of what is happening around us. So in simple terms, how can we explain that? Well, it's very easy. Situational awareness at its most basic is awareness of ourself, our equipment, our buddies, our environment, and most importantly, how that is going to affect the future. We're not mind readers. We're not fortune tellers. But we can use all of these different clues to help us to figure out what's going to go on. Now, you may notice that some people are great at that. They've automatically got the clues and they see things before anyone else. And they, they do seem like they're going to predict the future. Others, on the other hand, not so much. If you could play the video, please. So apologies for the slightly cheesy video, but hopefully it gets the point across. As you could tell, they clearly didn't trust Grandad. They wouldn't have moved so quickly into position when he said he was going to loosen the nut otherwise. And yet the communication wasn't there. They didn't double check that actually he was doing what he should be doing. It may have seemed obvious to anyone else who was there. But to them, they were stuck in that situation and they didn't see it. So communication is absolutely key. It's one of the first things that we need to be able to get the clues towards good situational awareness. Beatrice gave a great talk earlier all about communication. It's well worth watching if you didn't see it. In this photo, I was uh, taking photos of a group of people. And this girl had just finished her open water. This was her first dive after her open water course. Just as I pressed the shutter button, she gave me a nice big cheesy thumbs up. I lowered the camera down and looked at her and tilted my head to the side and went like that. And immediately she went, no, no, I'm okay. Those of you who are instructors might have seen this before. It's really common. It takes a lot of muscle memory to turn, yay, I'm great, into yeah, I'm OK. And afterwards, when we got back on the boat, we had a chat. And sure enough, that's what had happened. She was just thinking, I'm having a great time. So of course, I'm going to give a thumbs up. It's now become part of my briefing that when I'm taking photos of people, don't give me a thumbs up because I'm going to get really worried that you need to actually go. So communication is great. Closed loop communication is better. Confirming that what the person says is what they mean. In this case, I looked at her 
and gave her that back because that's what she'd given me. And that was when she realized her mistake and said, no, no, I'm okay. So closed loop communication is double checking and making sure that what the person is telling you is actually what they mean to tell you. We need to have full and understood communication to really get the clues that we need to understand everything. So gathering clues is a big part of situational awareness. Um, communication is part of that, but also we've got other things like body language and facial expression. I was diving recently with another group, once again, taking photos, and I happened to be looking around and trying to figure out where best to position myself to get the best shot of these girls, when suddenly one of them twitched. That's the only way I can explain it. She just moved in a strange way. And I could see from her face that something wasn't right. So I started swimming towards her. And almost immediately, she reached down and grabbed hold of her foot. And I realized that most likely she had cramp. Her buddy at that point had realized something was wrong. and We both reached her at the same time. We helped to stabilize her. And she started trying to massage her foot and get rid of the cramp. After a while, she signaled. I'm okay, brilliant. But then just as she was turning to get back into position to start swimming again, the pain came back and she reached down and grabbed her foot again. And at that point, she gave me a thumbs up. Well, her buddy was there as well, so I looked around. Luckily, there was another group nearby who were watching what was going on. So I signaled to her buddy, you, buddy up with those guys over there. Her buddy signaled back, me, buddy, with them. Brilliant, perfect closed loop communication. Off her buddy went and off we went up to the surface. She was absolutely fine, but it was a good example how communication can help make sure we get all the clues, but sometimes it's not just the hand signs we're doing. If I hadn't seen that twitch and then the very obvious grabbing of the foot, I wouldn't have known something was wrong. So experience gives us the ability to read all of those clues. I've seen people with cramp before, so I knew what it looked like, and that really helped me. However, experience also can help us miss things. Small changes can be really difficult, and when we've got more experience, we don't tend to think about the little changes. A great example of that is rebreather divers. When we dive in a rebreather, we always need to look at our PO2s. We need to be aware of what we're breathing. That's number one rule. But those numbers can change very slowly. And so it's easy to lose track of them because if they're changing so slowly, you're not necessarily gonna notice the changes. They're small numbers, they're small changes that are going, they're going up by. So small changes can make our lives very, very difficult. We need to have a baseline idea. In some ways, we've got some automatic systems which can help us with that. So for example, on rebreathers, you might have warnings set up if it goes below this level or above this level. And they will help us to make us aware of the situation, even if we've been sitting watching those numbers merrily tick over. Back to that new diver, again, they're watching the numbers tick over but in their case, they don't understand what the numbers mean. So they haven't got a full awareness of what they need to do, how they need to react. So we need to look at these clues and use these clues to see how they're going to affect the future. When you're diving with somebody different, you might not necessarily always get the clues that you need. However, some of you will probably always dive with the same buddy and suddenly, Life is easy. We love diving with the same buddy because we know what they're going to do. And I've lost track of how many times people have told me, yeah, I always dive with my partner or my friend, and he's brilliant because I know exactly what he's going to do just by a glance. Well, that's because you're reading him. You know what that person is going to do by a facial expression or by body language or even just by a twitch of the hand. Oh, no, he's got his camera and he's looking over there. Yeah, he's going to go off and chase that shark. I know that he's going to do that because he always does that. So it's very predictable. In that case, our situational awareness is very high 
because we can see what's going to happen. We understand, in this case, they're going to go off and chase the shark. And maybe we need to give them a tap on the shoulder and remind them that we're swimming off in the opposite direction. The other thing that helps us is we have familiar body language and familiar communications. Hand signs differ amongst people. Classic example is this one. If I've just asked someone how much gas they got and they're wearing a single tank on their back, this probably means 50 bar. But if I'm in doubles and, or a rebreather and someone gives me that all of a sudden, more likely they're telling me to hold. So familiarity with hand signs is also really, really important, as is obviously a good briefing to make sure everyone understands what all of those signs mean. Now, experience does help a lot because the more different divers you're diving with, the more you get to read them. However, we all know divers that have hundreds, maybe even thousands of dives, and yet they're completely oblivious to what's going on around them. They might be swimming backwards into the reef, for example. And it's really easy to look at those kind of people and go, oh yeah, but they're idiots. But why is it actually happening? How have they lost situational awareness like that? Think about the diver who's got his group of students in front of him and he's swimming backwards so he can watch them and focus on them. At that point, all of his attention is on his divers. He needs to know where they are and what they're doing. And as far as he's concerned, he's swimming backwards in a straight line. He might just have blue water in front of him, so he's not got any reference until suddenly, oh, oops, that's the reef behind him and he's swum straight into it. So there are different reasons why people can lose it. Complacency is one of them because I've always done it that way and therefore it's always going to be that way. That's where it needs people to check their complacency, both their own and their dive buddies. Ask people, but why are we doing it like that? And is there a better way of doing it? Also, you make certain assumptions. In the dive guide's case, he's swimming backwards. He's made the assumption that he's swimming in a straight line. It's a fair assumption to make. He's a dive guide. He should be fairly competent. And yet, without realizing it, he's slightly veered off and hasn't realized the reef is right behind him. So we have to check our assumptions as well. We have to double check and make sure that actually what we think is true is true. Another thing that can interrupt our clue gathering, our data gathering, is task loading. And I'm sorry to say, but us photographers are the worst at this. I know when I'm taking photos, my world is that big. That's it. That's all I'm looking at. So I need to be very, very conscious that at times I stop, I move the camera away, and I'm actually looking around me to make sure I do have a full awareness of the situation. Having said that, it happens. We lose it. One time I was taking photos of a watch, of all things, that was balanced on a rock. I was focused on the lighting and getting everything perfect and seeing what was happening behind it. I was getting closer and closer because you know, I've got to get close to get a good photo until, think, I banked the front of the camera off the rock and put a nice scratch in it. I'd lost awareness of how big my camera actually was because I was so focused on the task at hand. Other photographers you see swimming off in the wrong direction. Again, that example that I used earlier, your buddy's there off chasing a shark because that's what they're looking at. That's their focus at that precise moment in time. Their awareness of the fact the rest of the group is heading off that way has been totally lost. Now, you can use distractions to help out. They're not always a bad thing. I use them frequently with my students. And one way I use them is by telling them that every skill I give them is a distraction. What I want them to focus on are the basics. I want them to focus on breathing, buoyancy, and trim. If they can focus on all of those and they can stay in trim, they can stay neutrally buoyant without flapping up and down all over the place, and they can keep their breathing nice and relaxed, and I can give them a skill and they can complete it, great. I know that their situational awareness is there. I can tell 
because they're able to look at their computer while they're doing the skill. They're able to look around them and see not only the buddy directly in front of them, but the rest of the group as well, or their position in the water relative to the reef or relative to the ground. So I can tell they got full situational awareness. But if I give them an out of gas, for example, and suddenly they're sinking down, hey, they've probably lost it a little bit. So in that case, I'm going to take two steps forwards and one step back. If I've pushed them a bit too much and I can tell that they've lost their awareness, then hey, let's go back a bit. Let's work on the basics. Let's make sure that your buoyancy is actually where it needs to be. And then slowly start building up again by throwing distractions, aka skills, their way. The more you can practice these things, the more you can get this, these uh, skills to be automatic. But this takes conscious practice. You can't just go in and swim around and expect to have perfect buoyancy. You need to go in and try hovering, try not moving, and then see what happens. Some of my best students will come down for a weekend of training, and sure, they'll spend a few dives swimming around and having a great time, but they'll quite often use just one dive in the shallow water, and they'll drill skills with their buddy to make sure that if something happens, they can still deal with it. Now, these are certified divers. They've already passed the course, but they know full well the only way they can maintain that level is by constantly practicing it. One of the reasons why I became an instructor was to practice my skills, because if you're introducing the skills to other people all the time, then you've got to know them. And it certainly helped me. I'm constantly practicing these skills over and over and over again to the point where they've become second nature. So I can have full situational awareness. When I'm demonstrating a skill to a student, I need to be able to look and see that they're still comfortable, that they're okay, that they're safe, that the rest of the group are all right as well. And the only way we do this is by consciously practicing and making sure that what we're doing is not just the skill itself, but all of the other extra bits as well. Now, one thing that can make life difficult is change in established procedure. We all have a level of capacity, a level of ability of things that we can do at once. That's about seven things, plus or minus a couple. If you start using five of these things, five of these points, just to be able to hover, then you're not going to be able to do extra things. And when we're changing small established procedures, that takes more capacity than you would realize. I was on a course recently, I was the student, and we were practicing an out of gas drill, something that I have practiced many, many times with my students. But there were small changes to the procedures that were slightly unfamiliar to me. I needed to make sure that I'd taken things with the right hand and donated with the right hand and things like that. So I was really focused on these. So it was my turn to be out of gas. I gave my diver a nice big out of gas sign and he donated. I took the regulator, took mine out of my mouth and I couldn't put that one in. Thanks to COVID, of course, couldn't breathe from it. So, okay, no worries. We'd agreed that we'd put the short hose in instead. And I'm holding this and I'm waiting, looking around and suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder. It's my instructor reminding me to clip off my long hose. I'd forgotten something so basic, but so much of my capacity had been taken that I hadn't focused on it. So how do we deal with these things? Number one, we focus, we don't fixate. Focus on the important things. We will naturally focus on things that are dangerous, dangerous interesting, pleasurable and important. But sometimes that's not always the correct thing. That shark swimming off into the distance might mean your buddy needs a tap on the shoulder and a reminder to go the right way. It's really hard to recognize that you've lost situational awareness in yourself. So you need to think about having buddies there. They're gonna help you. However, in somebody else, it's slightly easy. When you've got somebody else, hopefully you can see that they're doing things like losing basic skills, like, for example, buoyancy. You're seeing that they're making simple mistakes, like forgetting to clip off the long hose. 
you're seeing that perhaps they're ignoring others. They've got task fixation. They're so fixated on the thing that they're doing that they've forgotten to look around them and be aware of everything else that's going on. So how do we build situational awareness? Well, as I said before, we've got to gather clues. We need as much information as possible to try and make sure we're making the right decisions. Also, experience helps. But most important, we need the automatic processes. Buoyancy, trim, and breathing. When you can make things automatic, that frees up your capacity to be able to deal with other problems. When you've got that point, as I said before, build slowly. Two steps forward, one step back. Keep going back and practicing the basics. Make it as automatic as possible. It's a slow process. You can't rush it. We quite often have students come up and say, so I'm ready for the next course. Great. How many dives have you done since the last one? Oh, I've done five. Okay. We say we need to gain experience, but what do we mean by gaining experience? There's a well-known saying that a thousand dives in the same place may as well just be one dive. And it's true. I have thousands of dives in the Red Sea. Great, I'm a competent Red Sea diver. But a few years ago, I ended up back in the UK and I knew that this was uh, something completely different. I'd done my open water course in the UK and never dived there since. Now, we started off simply. We started off diving in the quarries with a single tank, but it was still very, very new to me. I'd asked my dive buddy to introduce me to the very best of UK diving, you know, uh, bad visibility, strong currents, and oh yeah, cold water. And he most certainly managed that. So we started off with cold water and bad visibility, and we slowly built up. After a while, I was feeling much more comfortable. I was back on the rebreather, which I was still relatively new to. And one day we decided to go out and dive the Kiara. The Kiara is a wreck off the south coast. It's at about 35 or 40 meters. And um, on the way there, my buddy looks at me and said, do you have a torch? I thought it was only 35 or 40 meters. Ah, yeah, this is the UK. It's going to be dark. Okay, well, I've got my camera, so I'll just put the focus lights on. No problem. Okay, fine. So in we jump, and I realized that I had a leaking dry suit. I told this to my buddy, but no worries, I'm, I'm okay, I'm comfortable, so let's go. We start making our way down the shot line, and I realized the leak's a little bit worse than I'd realized. But determined, I've decided I'm going to do half an hour. Half an hour. It's going to happen. We get to the bottom of the wreck, and I've got no idea what's going on. We seem to have currents pushing us all ways. It's very, very dark. And my buddy says to me, are you okay? Mm. Yeah, sure, I'm okay, let's go. We swim around the wreck for a bit and I'm looking at my computer, I'm looking at the time. Checking the time, I'm checking the time. It's gonna be half an hour soon, I'm getting colder and colder. Eventually, the magic 30 minutes appears. Brilliant, I've done it. Let's go, let's get out of here. We get to the shot line and start making our way up. And on the way up, I look again at my computer and realized I hadn't checked my gas at any point during that dive. I didn't know what I was breathing. The number one rule of rebreather diving, because I was so overloaded with everything else. I didn't have the experience to safely do that dive. One thing that can help you is buddies, as he did on that dive. Buddies can help you to really focus on the big picture. They can see what else is going wrong. So if you're being sucked into a lot of situational awareness, they can give you that tap on the shoulder and remind you. They can also help you by doing good debriefs. Debriefs will really, really help to remind you that, hey, you know what, at that point, you've lost awareness. You didn't know that your buddies were swimming off in the opposite direction. But be careful during de debriefs. Heuristics don't help. I should have done this. I would have done this. I could have done that. Instead, stick to what am I going to do next time to make sure I don't make that same mistake? So in summary, communication is key. 
you need to make sure that communication is there, is full, is understood. Think about that closed loop communication to double check that what you're being told is actually, actually accurate. Remember, I see, I understand, I react. Need all three of those parts to have full situational awareness. If one is missing, then you can't really say you have a full situational awareness. Check any assumptions that you might make. And also get your buddies to look out if you're becoming complacent. They're the ones who need to be able to tap you on the shoulder and remind you of that. For that, you do need high level of psychological safety, which some other people have touched on this week. But if they can tell you that, hey, you know what? You're getting complacent, you're letting things slide because nothing's ever gone wrong or we've always done it that way, then let them help you to regain that situational awareness. You can also reduce task loading if it's appropriate. Sometimes we use it to help people, but sometimes you've just got to take that camera off the open water diver and let them focus on just simply staying neutrally buoyant. Consciously practice the basics. Think about what you're doing. Jump in with a dive buddy and get somebody there to help you. If you need to, film yourselves because then you'll spot that, oh, hang on a minute, something else was happening in the background that we had no idea, <coughs> excuse me, was going on. Try and make things as unconscious as possible. Excuse me. <coughs> Remember that two steps forwards and one step back. <coughs> Promise you it's not COVID. Focus on the relevant things, <coughs> but don't fixate. Need to make sure you've got enough capacity to be able to look around you. Watch out for students losing situational awareness and stop them if it's appropriate. Sometimes it can be a great learning point. <coughs> Explain to students what we mean by experience. It's not just, okay, you need 10 dives. You need 10 relevant dives where you're building on the skills that you learned during this course. Think about different situations for them, different dive buddies, different areas. <coughs> All of these will help them. Use your buddy or your team to help you out. They're the ones who are going to tap you on the shoulder and remind you that you've lost your awareness. And finally, if you notice somebody losing situational awareness, then <coughs> don't forget to step back and assess the big picture yourself. Anybody got any questions? Jenny, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Such an animated session. If you want to, yeah, uh, parch, your, parch your throat. Uh, it's a bit warm or, or now. your throat, that's cool. Um, really, really good session. Um, some, some great points here. And, and, and it is such a difficult thing to develop in other people. Um, and, and actually, that's that's one of the things that I would say is, you know, you're, I'm guessing you have photography students who come in, want to work with you in terms of developing their own underwater photography. What, what would be the, the tip that you would give to underwater photographers in terms of managing their situation awareness so they don't become too task focused on, on the situation? Practice the basics. Make sure you've got the basics down pat before you do anything else. I've lost track of how many people try and grab a camera on their first dive straight after their open water course because they don't understand. They don't know what they don't know. So they need to be able to hop. You can give them, <coughs> sorry, I'm struggling here. You can give them really objective things. So for example, you should be able to hover half a meter off the ground without kicking any sand up, without kicking anything behind you. That gives them an actual thing that they can go and practice before they get the camera in their hand. Also, think, ask them what they're going to do if they get too close to something. How are they going to back off? Because they won't have thought of that. Again, they don't know what they don't know. So you've got to help them. So getting the basics down is going to really help them. And the other thing I remind them to do is every now and then stop and look up. Maybe every two photos, maybe even every one photo. Take the shot, stop, 
look around you, see what's going on, check your gas. Some people wear their dive computer on their camera itself so that they can just glance up at it because otherwise they just don't register it. There are loads and loads of things that they can do. That's brilliant. I mean, that's that sort of <coughs> echoes my own diving development of doing fundies, GE fundamentals to give me the stable platform because it's that bit that says I now have capacity mm -hmm. to see what else is going on around. And when I went to the Normoxic course, so I could do shallower dives without even thinking about the diving. It's about building that technical competence, the capacity, the experience. So you can just sit there, take the shot, look around, take the shot, look around. And and yeah, it, it's great. So I know I've got a photographer in here. So Phil, uh, I'm gonna bring you up onto the stage and you can ask a question of Jenny. I feel a bit bad now because you, you've been coughing at things asking questions. <laughs> um, I, I, it's not really a photography question, really, because I teach underwater photography and I, I, I feel your pain with the, the, you know, the filming somebody and not seeing the manta in your shot and, and very much all the sort of stuff you said about photography is very relevant. What I was going to say is I, I worked in healthcare for a long time and we did a lot of our training was sort of simulation based. Um, over the last sort of more recent years, it's become a very big thing. And do you do you think there's a place for more simulation style training in uh, diving to help build that kind of pattern recognition? Where because I mean, from my experience, I've done a lot of diving with a lot of different people and had things go wrong. And often to me, it's like I can see this going wrong. Whereas the people who've not got that experience might never have that until the moment where it all goes and and things uh, uh, can go badly. Yeah, exactly. Very much so. Um, I mean, a big part of the training courses that I run are simulations. <coughs> I won't let people, for example, go into deco until they've run successful simulations. And I will throw things at them during that to try and disrupt them. Another thing <clears throat> that we use quite successfully at the Human Diver is running a simulation to put people in a different situation to what they're used to. And as an observer, standing back and seeing what's going on, seeing that complete loss of awareness is great. When you then let them review it and go through, and they realize that they've just lost it. Okay, great, brilliant. Now you know you've lost it. Why did you lose it? Let's look at those reasons because without the why, you're not going to gain any learning. There's no point just saying, oh yeah, bad luck, you've lost it, what's next? But it's always going back to the why. Let's try and solve this. What are we going to change? What are we going to do differently next time to make sure that that simulation was worth running, that we've learned something from it? So yeah, simulations are incredibly valuable for this kind of thing. Thanks. Thank you. Gareth, we can't hear you. Uh, press the button and there we go. Laura, over to you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Jenny. That was a really great talk. I've been writing down a lot of the, of the little tips there. The question I've got is more of a, can you expand on something? Um, so um, like you kind of recognize that sometimes a lot of the focus kind of gets dragged on to the skills as if like the skills are all we need to do and we get kind of caught up in, oh, we need to do the skills. And then it completely devalues all that background you know, the actual foundational skills. And the students don't even see that they're doing something really well because we're not even paying any attention to it. So I really, really love that tip you had about every skill that you give them is a distraction and you really want them to focus on the basics whilst they do that to kind of really put a lot more value and attention on those basics. So I just wondered if you could maybe expand on that point a bit more and maybe how you set that up in the briefing as well, please. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll always explain to them that um, we're going to be practicing, obviously, these are the list of skills that we would like to practice during the dive. Um, but I'm very, very flexible on that. If we only do one of those, 
because they lose all their awareness during that skill, then there's no point just battering on and continuing just to get the skills done. So taking it really, really slow is important. And I make that very clear during the briefing. Then when we get underwater and we'll do something, I'll give them the, the skill and I try and make it uh, obvious to them when they've lost their awareness. So for example, um, uh, an out of gas is a brilliant example because it takes two people. And I will position them in a place where I have something very, very obvious. Where I do a lot of my training, there's a concrete block just resting on the seabed. And I'll ask them to hover directly over the top of that concrete block. We'll then do the skill and then I'll ask them to look around them and see where the concrete block is. And nine times out of 10, the first time they do it, they've moved a long way. So, okay, no problem. Stop, come back to the block. Now let's do it again. Remember, don't thin. Oh yeah, okay. So now let's do it, focusing just on staying still. Brilliant, now they've got it, but now they've maybe gone up. So, okay, we need to look at the computer. All right, let's just stop for a minute and just practice our hovering. The sign that I use most with my students is breathe. And they know that when I tell them to breathe, all I want them to do is just hover, just relax and try their best to stay in position. Try not to be moving around. So every time I'm coming back to that, stop, breathe, relax. When they're relaxed again and they're okay, then we can continue with the skill. And quite often the other sign that I'm using is slow down, take it easy. If they're hurrying through something, then of course you can tell that they're getting sucked into it because they're trying to do it really quickly. Um, an SMB is another great one that we use quite often. So when they're sending up an SMB, then I want them to break it down into small steps. So step one is get the SMB out of their pocket. Great, now stop, breathe. Okay, step two, unravel it. Stop, breathe. And it goes through the skill step by step like that until eventually they get comfortable enough they can do it at a normal speed. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. I'm very much aware of time. There's more I'm going to say to that, but I really like the um, this bringing lots of attention to the value of stopping and the value of doing nothing because we so often let people kind of go off and then we criticize them later for not being able to pause, but we never paid any attention to it in the first place. We didn't help them to stay there. So that's a really, really useful tip. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. I was as guilty as it as anyone when I first started. I used to rush through things and try and get them done because I had that in my brain that we needed to finish all of that during the dive. But actually having that flexibility to say, no, we're just going to do what you're able to do and not being afraid to say people to say to people, OK, you can stop now and maybe let's not continue with the course. Let's just go and practice because that's going to get you far more value than trying to say, OK, now we need to do this skill. Now we need to do that skill. That just doesn't work. It's a great question, Laura. And you're right, you know, and you've got lots more questions. So Jenny is going to be in the lobby in Meet the Speaker Hall 1 uh, at the table there. So if you've got some more questions, you want to speak to Jenny, uh, that's fine. Uh, go for it. Um, the next speaker is me. Uh, and actually, I'm going to address one of the points that we just brought about is time limitations and the messy world of diving that, uh, that we're going to carry on. Um, and we'll have that at the top of the hour. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. Jenny, thanks very much. Really animated, really good. Well done. Thank you.